Hey, what is up, everybody? How you doing? Joe McCall here. This is the Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. We've got a really good guest here on this episode. We're going to be talking about land, and we're going to be talking specifically uh, my love language. I love talking about technology and tools, and Howard Zonder uh, from Land Speed is here. And we're going to be talking about how you can use technology and tools to accelerate and help you in your business. I've always said the three keys to success in business, no matter what kind of deals you're doing, wholesaling, short sales, foreclosures, land, lease options, the three keys to success is marketing, automation, and delegation. And you need to learn tools. How can you let tools, how can you use tools to um, serve you in your business to help you automate? And then whatever you can't automate, you delegate out to virtual assistants. And so we're gonna be talking about that specifically as it relates to the land business, but we're also going to be talking about how this could relate to housing uh, housing, and, and whatever else type of business that you do. All right. It's a lot of good principles in here. And I love land investing. We'll be talking about that here in a minute. But first, I want to announce two things. Number one, if you're listening to this show, right now we're broadcasting it live to Facebook and YouTube. We also rebroadcast this as an audio podcast to the podcasting world, which is my... Uh, I'm super excited about the podcast. It's really been growing leaps and bounds over the last, geez, six to 12 months. And um, audience keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you're listening to this podcast, I want to encourage you to please subscribe. If you're on an Apple device, subscribe to us on the podcast app. If you're on an Android, you know, there's Google Play, there's Stitcher, there's Spotify, there's um, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, whatever podcast player you like, um, you can subscribe to the show. That way we release three episodes a week and you'll be notified every time a new one comes available. Okay. So if you're watching this on YouTube and Facebook right now, um, you can subscribe to the podcast because sometimes with technology, especially with the internet speeds going on right now and um, everybody's working from home and, and a lot of people are doing video conferencing and stuff like that. Sometimes my podcast cannot be broadcast out live or it's stuttering or it's, you know, uh, skipping or whatever. So just subscribe to the podcast. The second announcement I want to give you real quick. This podcast is brought to you by my book, Wholesaling Lease Options. Uh, this is one of the easiest and fastest ways to make money in real estate today. It's by flipping lease options. And you can get this book for free at wlobook.com, wlobook.com. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to announce it something real cool. We just released this week an audio version of this book. So stay tuned. That's coming. Hopefully, if you're on my email list, you'll see an email today or tomorrow about that. Um, but you can get this book for free at wlobook.com. It takes you a couple hours to read. It's pretty thin, a quarter of an inch thick. But uh, it's what I used to quit my job at the height of the recession. When, when In 2009, people were not quitting their jobs, right? People were like clinging to their jobs, hoping that they wouldn't get fired because everybody, the, the economy was falling apart. We're starting to see that again a little bit here. I don't know what the future holds. I'm not going to predict anything, but um, it's it's important to understand different alternative creative strategies to offer sellers. So you're not just a one trick pony doing just cash offers on deals, which is why I'm excited to bring our guest today on as well, because we're going to be talking about how to do land deals. Um, so again, if you want my book, go to wlobook.com. And I'm going to bring my guest on. His name is Howard Zonder. He's from a company called Land speed. Howard, how are you, sir? I'm doing terrific, Joe. Great to be on the show. Nice. you got some real nice, fancy looking degrees there. And, <laughs> and uh, that tells me that you're a deep analytical, um, mathematical, you, you like numbers. Am I right? Am I guessing you, am I reading you right? I like my data. I, I like, yeah. I like my spreadsheets. Yes. <laughs> uh, but mostly what I like is using them to make money. Yes. Amen. All right. Uh, I, I love talking spreadsheets and I love talking uh, numbers like that because I love spreadsheets. The thing I found those spreadsheets is you got to be careful because sometimes you can have spreadsheets tell you anything you want it to tell you, right? Um, <laughs> but the, sometimes people though are running around rudderless and they have no idea what their numbers are. And I've said this over and over again. If you don't know your numbers, you don't have a real business. That's and fair. so while it's important not to be too analytical and diving deep in the numbers, you need the numbers. You need the data to help you make better offers, to help you follow up so no leads fall through the cracks and all that good stuff, right? So that's exactly right. You know, I, I just I just posted some a meme on uh, on one of my Facebook pages that uh, it was a quote from Warren Buffett where he said. Uh, 
uh, if you can't control your emotions, you can't control your money. Mm. And uh, my comment on that was you know, that, that's true, but there's a piece that's missing, which is you have to have confidence. Because yeah. if you don't know your numbers, and you don't understand what you know what the market is then how could you not do it with emotion you've got to have the knowledge so that you can remove the emotion yeah very good so um we're, we're going to talk about some things that howard is doing with his business he's got some really cool tools out there that i've used before and um so I, I'm, I'm hoping that we get to talk about that and i'm sure we will first of all though let me say too if you're watching this on youtube or facebook right now type in something in the comments in the chat say hello We've got somebody here. I'm just going to guess Yosef Ben Israel. That's a cool name. It's a really cool name. But I, I, I'm you're watching from where? I'm just curious. So hello to you. If you're on this, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, uh, just type in hello. Tell us where you're from. And if you've got questions for Howard, this is the time to type them in, and I will make sure we get all of your questions to Howard, okay? Um, Howard, Um I, let me just say to you and to everybody else, kind of put a, a story behind this. Um, I love land investing. You know, it's something that I've been doing so for about three years now. I found some good friends of mine from church and we started doing land flips together. We did about 30 of them. Life got busy. Um, we uh, They had kids. They moved into a new house. I got busy with a bunch of projects. We kind of put it on hold, but um, we're still, we just did some marketing with one of, I have two sons. They're 14 and 16 years old. And we've been starting to ramp that up again because I want my boys to do something. And the thing I like about land that's different than houses, especially for my 14, 16 year olds, is they don't have to talk to as many sellers, right? They don't have to negotiate necessarily. Um, and, you know, they're mature. Maybe I'm, I'm I'm not giving them enough credit, but I love land because like you just make offers, right? There's no emotion involved. There's no, you don't have to negotiate or try to build rapport with sellers. You know what I mean? Is that right? Well, uh, so I'm the kind of guy that negotiates at Walmart, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I negotiate everything. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you're when you're sending your initial offers out, so there's two ways to send offers out in the land. You can send blind offers, in which case it's like a purchase agreement and it's got an offer of value on it. Or you can send what they call neutral offers, which basically says, hey, I'm Joe. I'm looking to buy land in your area. Let me know if you want to sell. And then you follow up with an offer. Yeah. Uh, in the first case, you know, if you're sending out hundreds or thousands of offers, you can't really go deep, deep, deep into the pricing analysis of every one. The goal is to get as accurate as you possibly can within reason, because you know that only one to three percent of your letters are going to convert. So you don't want to kill yourself on the front end. And then when you get into the due diligence of the property after somebody says they want to sell it to you, then you're looking deeply into the property and maybe you're going to find out that, oh, you maybe I, I mispriced this a little bit. Um, or even if you don't, you might just say, you know what, every time I get past the due diligence, this is my last opportunity to negotiate. So let me see if I can get another hundred dollars off the price or two hundred dollars off the price. So I think there's always an opportunity, at least, to negotiate on both the buy and the sell side. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so talk about what do you prefer, blind offers or neutral letters yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I don't think there's a right or wrong you know i think there are different schools teach it different ways um uh and uh, one thing i found is that when i send a blind offer what i like, like i said what i really want is i want to have some degree of confidence that that offer is correct because uh you know there are some people out there who you know it pricing is hard right so they just say, oh, everybody gets a $500 offer or everybody gets a $250 per acre offer. Uh, it's a one size fits all. But the reality is that uh, the value of properties can change drastically from one side of a county to the other. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you have some tools uh, and you've got and you, you put forth the effort, you can get pretty accurate with with your with your offers. Um, now, that said, if a property is in with uh, inside a, an established subdivision, and there are good comps there, then you can feel pretty confident that you understand market pricing and from there you can develop offers. There will be other pieces of land that are out in what I call unincorporated county land. And there are far fewer comps and so the confidence level goes down. So sometimes what I'll do is I will send out blind offers where I've got confidence and I'll send out neutral offers where I have less confidence and I can or, mix and match them in the same campaign. If you got two boys working for you, Send yeah. out all neutral letters, 
right? And make them do the research on each of the responses that come back. I love it. And have them. Say, so this is what, that's what I do. And, and just and they create competition point. between them. Well, yeah. yeah and then, so <laughs> they get a bigger percentage of the, they get, well, yeah, if it's one of their deals, they get a bigger split, but yeah. um, it is pretty cool. Okay. But let's, let's talk about your business, Howard. How did you get interested in land? So I was uh, a corporate guy for a very long time. Well, let me even back up before that. Before that, I was, I was a Marine, right? So I was a Marine for, for, for quite a while. Uh, I got out of the Marine Corps, went to graduate school. Uh, when I was in the Marines, I was in communications. And I got out. By the time I got out of graduate school, it was 1996. So it was right when the, uh, back then the Telecom Reform Act was coming out in 1996. So I was like, oh. I'm a communications guy, telecommunications. I'm going to be good for 30 years. I'm rock solid, uh, which just shows the level of ignorance that I had back then. Uh, it was it was a complete roller coaster of an industry, um, but I did enjoy it. So I did telecom, I did software, uh, and then in the last five years, I actually switched and I was in the event industry uh, for five years. I was uh, hmm. a chief marketing officer for uh, part of uh, the, the second largest event company in the world. Uh, with uh, with you know marketers and staff uh, you know far and wide uh, from Istanbul to Amsterdam, London, L.A., Sao Paulo, all over the place. A lot of time on airplanes. Um, did that for five years, and that was coming to an end uh, at the end of 2015. All good things must come to an end. And I just the idea of going back to uh, another soul sucking corporate job uh, was about more that I could bear. Uh, Oh my gosh, <laughs> Howard, I had a dream last night. I had a dream last night that I was at the corporate offices of my former employer walking around trying to find my cubicle. I was like, it was a nightmare or something. It wasn't that bad. I mean, but I was freaking <laughs> out when I woke up. Like, what? I was dreaming. I was walking around looking for my cubicle. Oh, <laughs> uh, cubicles. I remember that. that. I call it cubic hill. <laughs> well, I think I did what so many other people that get into real estate did. I started listening to a lot of podcasts and I'm like, all right, you know, I, I don't know what else I want to do. What I year know was I, this? I'm sorry. What year was this? This was the end of 2015. Okay. Um, so I started listening to a bunch of podcasts and I, I stumbled upon land amongst many other things, but uh, the land proposition just kind of, it resonated with me, but I didn't take action on it. I had to hear it a few different times from a few different people. And then suddenly I'm like, you know what? This actually kind of makes sense to me, and uh, and so I, I said I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into this a little bit. I'm you know I'll, I'll risk a little bit of money if it works out great. If it doesn't work out, you know you don't learn if you don't try. So uh, I tried it, and uh, and sure enough, you know the business model is legit. It, it was working, and the the ROIs were were pretty tremendous. Now, how did you uh, try it out? What what area did you go into, and what uh, what did you do? Well, so I, I was just, I, you know, I, I started with a program and I just followed exactly what they told me to do. And I started sending her out, out these blind offers. Uh, uh, I started out in um, uh, Colorado and Utah. And uh, the first property I ever bought was in Utah. It was such a piece of crap. It was <laughs> quarter acre in southeastern Utah in the middle of nowhere when you look at it on a map, there are roads, but when you look at it from satellite view, there actually aren't any <laughs> roads yeah. at all. And, uh, and and I paid too much for it. And after it was all over, I'm thinking, oh my God, how am I ever going to get rid of this thing? And it, it actually took me six to seven months to get rid of it. Um, I got I made an 83% ROI on it. It's the worst deal I ever did. Okay. 83% ROI. This is amazing. This is why I like land. You bought it for how much? Uh, that was a long time ago. Um, I, don't quite remember. I probably it was well under a thousand dollars. Maybe I brought maybe seven hundred dollars. And then you sold it for about how much? I probably sold it for over. I don't remember the numbers. Maybe Which it was a little paid, over two thousand. Sold it for cash, probably. I sold it for cash. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I sold that one for cash. It was a little over two thousand, I would think. So let's say you did make a mistake and you couldn't sell it, right? Yeah. You, you're out seven hundred, eight hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, right? Not a big deal. Um, so then, then what did you do? I wouldn't be out of it. Okay. Uh, what I would do at that point is I would probably put it on eBay uh, on an auction starting at zero with a three or four, say a $499 dock fee. Yeah. So that even if somebody bought it for $1, <laughs> I'd still make $500 on it. And I know we'd be down to $200. Or you could sell it with owner financing, couldn't you? 
50 bucks a month? If I could find a buyer for it. I mean, it was kind of a weird property. And the interesting thing was, is the woman who bought it for me, about a year and a half to two years later, she reached out to me and asked me if I had any other property in the area, which completely blew me away. Wow. Wow. Yeah. All right. So then what did you do after that? Um, so I bought that while I was waiting to sell that, I continued to work the process. I bought other properties. Uh, I did have a, an early home run, which was fantastic. Um, uh, I bought a property, a 40 acre property in Colorado. Um, and I, I didn't really know how to do pricing back then. So I priced, I was doing what I told you you shouldn't do, which is everybody sort of gets the same offer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I priced this one extremely low for what it was worth. And uh, the gentleman who owned it was in Michigan in his 70s. And, uh, and he, you know, he called me up and said, hey, I got your letter. Yeah, let's do the deal. I was, I was taking a little back. I'm like, okay. And I'm trying to be really cool about it. I'm like, okay, great. Uh, you okay with the price? He's like, yeah, the price is fine. And I'm like, this is great. Uh, so it turns out, and this is a classic story in Lance. They lived in Michigan. They they went on a vacation to Colorado. They loved it. They said, let's buy some land. We'll put a cabin on there. It will become our vacation property. They go back to Michigan. Life goes on. Life gets in the way. They never built the cabin. They were responsible. They, they always paid their property taxes. Uh, and then they got old. And then sadly, at the time I talked to him, his wife had passed away about five years earlier. And he had no interest in the property and just wanted to get rid of it. He was happy to give it to me. So I picked up this 40 acres for $1,900. Hmm. And I 40, started whoa, marketing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I know. 40 acres for $1,900. 40 acres for $1,900. That's $1,900. That's right. Was this in the flat desert or at the foothills or where was this? Uh, it was in, uh, so, so people who are in land all know Costilla County. It's, um, it's, it's right on the New Mexico border. It's, uh, it's not the prettiest county. It's the poorest county in Colorado, but there is a ton of land there. A lot of land. And you can so, see the mountains. Real, in the uh, you can see, you can see Blanca Peak, which is the fourth highest peak in Colorado. Uh, this happened to be in an area that was a little bit more hilly than uh, much of the flat land there. So it, it wasn't bad. Um, so it, it was okay. I mean, it was a 40 acre. They get a lot of five acre lots down there as well. So I marketed it and, um, I, I found a buyer and I sold it on owner financing. Um, and then they reached out to me and changed their mind, but they didn't say, can I have my money back? They said, can you just let me out of the contract? Yeah. And I said, sure. Do you remember so what price you sold it? Do you remember what price you sold it for? Uh, that one I don't, but I'll, I'll tell you what I ultimately sold it for. So, um, but I, you know, so I got the down payment and the doc fee and then I put it out there again and the same thing happened a second time. So now I've collected two down payments, two doc fees, put it out there a third time and I sold it and it stuck and I sold it, uh, for, well, I don't remember the, the dollar value, but, uh, basically I got the third down payment and doc fee. So the property was completely paid for by that point. And I get about five hundred dollars a month for ten years. So when you add it all together, my my total my total pro, or, or revenue was about fifty four thousand dollars. Beautiful. At a nineteen hundred dollar investment. Five hundred dollars a month for yeah. ten years. So sixty thousand dollars, and you paid nineteen hundred for it. <laughs> That's it. That's what land yeah. is like. I was hooked. <laughs> yeah. At that point. You didn't go look at the land? I've never seen any of the land I bought or sold. You didn't get it inspected? You didn't have to um, pull in permits or worry about tenants? None of that stuff. None of the above. All right. So um, what does your business look like today? So um, I still am an active land investor, but uh, I do less on the active land investing. I do some. But more, more likely, I'm investing with other land investors, and primarily because the majority of my time has been sucked up into my other business, which is Land Speed. So yeah. that's my land business. Land Speed is the uh, is the CRM and automation program that I've developed for land investors. Um, yeah, and what happened gonna... was, I uh, after about six to nine months in the business, um, my deal flow got to a point where I just couldn't manage it on spreadsheets and post-it notes anymore. 
And uh, I said, you know what, I, I got to do something here. And, and the amazing thing is, and I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to say this, <laughs> but I was still mailing out of my house. Oh, that is embarrassing. It is. I was, I was printing my letters. I was printing my envelopes. I was folding and stuffing and licking stamps and bringing it. It's probably spending four to six hours a week just on mail. And I didn't have a 14 or 16 year old I could pass it off to. So, yeah. uh, so I did that. And uh, do I you use, do you use click to mail now. I do. Yes. Yeah, that's I want to talk about that. Um, all right. For first, because, because we got some good questions here. Frank says, hello. What's up, Frank? Philip from Pennsylvania. What's up? Frank is from Daytona beach. Yosef is from North Carolina. Tom, what's going on? Alexander just bought the book. Nice. Marlins from Kansas City. Now I've got this question a couple times here. How do you get comps on land? We're going to talk about this. Somebody else said, Marcus, I would also like to know how to get comps for land. And how do you value the land based on little to no comps? And then Alexander said, I think Joe uses Zillow to look up comps for land most of the time. Kind of true. And uh, before we talk about land speed, because you're really good at software. And uh, this is something that uh, I, I'm excited to talk about. You um, you developed a software that helps people come up with comps before land speed. Am I right? I, I developed land speed first. And I developed okay. the comping tool a little bit later. And what's that comping tool called? It's called Price Boss. That's right. Because that's what I've signed up for and I've used that. Can you talk about what Price Boss does real quick? Or maybe you don't want to. That's fine. You just want to oh, talk no, about it. Absolutely happy to. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it really, uh, it, it started with a customer of mine. So I, I was doing all, everything that do, that's done in Price Boss, I was doing it on spreadsheets just because, you know, I know spreadsheets. But the fact of the matter is the kind of formulas and tools and thing and pivot tables and the kind of things that I was doing in spreadsheets pivot was tables. Not, <laughs> not what the average person knows or wants to know how to do. Oh. Uh, and so my customer uh, wanted help in this area, and I started to show him how to do this on a spreadsheet. And I said, this is, this is not the way to do it. Let me create a tool that you don't have to know anything about spreadsheets, and it'll, it'll work great. And so what Price Boss does, there's, there's, there's uh, three different sections to it. So the first section is where you, is where you collect and aggregate comps. Um, and the way it works is you would go to a, a website like, Landwatch or Zillow or Craigslist, and you would put in the search for the kind of land that you want to buy. And then when the results come up, you can just scrape the results. You highlight them all. Yeah, highlight them all, and then just copy and paste it into the tool, hit a button, and it'll take all of that data and it'll give it to you on a set of lines and says, okay, this property, this is where it is, this is, uh, this is the cost of the property, this is the acreage of the property. Uh, and then it, it, it does a little bit more than that. And so you can collect all this with, with Zillow, like so Zillow, Craigslist, Lane Watch. And then there's a, an area where you can use Redfin. You can use data that you got from the county uh, so that you can bring a lot of comps in from different areas. And you can do both uh, sold comps. So yep. you would get sold comps from the county or potentially Zillow or for sale comps. After you've collected all your data, then you can you hit a button and it aggregates it all into one list and it yeah. calculates the price per acre of all the properties. And you can put, there's a little uh, spot where you can put in a discount factor. Now a sold comp is a sold comp. That's what it is. That's what it's worth. But a for sale comp, you might assume that the final negotiated price is less than the asking price. So let's just say you think the final negotiated price is going to be 20%. So you put 20% in just one time, and then all the for sale comps will automatically be adjusted minus the 20%. Um, and then finally, once you've got all your data right, then, then you go into the analysis section. And uh, it does some interesting things. It gives you a scatter plot diagram so you can clearly visually see what your outliers are. An outlier is data that doesn't make sense. And you've got to get it out of your analysis or it's going to screw up your results. Exactly. So it makes it real easy to identify outliers and then you go delete that. And then you can say, I want in the little box to say, I want my offers to be 20 cents on the dollar or 25 or 15, whatever number you want. And, and it, it creates a grid for you. And it'll create a list of subdivisions on one side and a list of acreage splits on the other side. So it might be zero to one acre, one to three acres, three to five acres, whatever. 
And then it'll just tell you what your offer should be in each of those categories and how many counts it's based on. Yeah, this is so cool, guys. You got to just see it. And if we had the time, I would ask Howard to demonstrate it. Um, and you can if you want, but uh, where can people go? I don't get any commissions from this. I just want to let people know if they want to see you do a demo of this, where can they go to see that? Well, they can do better than a demo. They can download a, a 10 day free trial. Okay. So just go to uh, Land Speed Tech. That's L A N D Land Speed S P E E D Tech T E C H dot com slash price dash boss. And you can sign up for a 10 day free trial. And there are training videos in, in, embedded into the tool so you can figure out how to use it. If you have any questions, you can always reach out and I'll be happy to answer them. Landspeedtech.com slash price dash boss. That's it. And if you're listening to the audio podcast of this, um, the links that we give to you will be in the show notes at realestateinvestingmastery.com. First, I want to, before we move on, I want to give a shout out to my good buddy, Corey Kilborn's in the house. Good friend back from years and years ago. And he's watching on Facebook. How you doing, Corey? Say hi to Natalie and your two daughters for me. We got Chris from Tampa, Dale from New Orleans. What's up, Dale? Um, and a qu question here from Yosef. He's got two questions. Does tax assessed values play a part in land with little to no comps? And if you get a land deal at 50% of the tax value, would this be a good deal? So this is a question that frequently comes up. And uh, my, my stock answer to this is that the only state that I really value assessed values is Florida. Really? Florida data is phenomenal. And you can, but you got to contact the county and you've got to figure out what the correlation is between assessed value and market value. But once you do that, then you can use assessed value to figure out your offers. In any other state, I, I would not trust assessed value. I mean, let's figure out what, what an assessed value is. It's something that they use in order to be able to figure out how much property tax you should pay. Right. So the whole goal of assessed value has nothing to do with market value. They may in some way figure it based on market value, but maybe not. You know, Maybe it's just what they can get. And typically uh, in most states, they only do assessed value every other year which means that it's not very current as well. So um, I, I much prefer to go get comps and using a tool like Price Plus, you can scrape all these comps off these different sites and you can get enough comps to feel confident in, in your pricing. So let me ask you this here because um, this, this is something that I'm always struggling with with my boys, right? So we get a land, we send out a letter, we get about 10% response rate on our letters right now. Which That's great. If you're from, and these are just neutral letters. Yeah. And uh, about 10% response. Uh, so we sent out a campaign a few months ago, 1,500 letters. We got 150 calls and we got seven properties under contract. So I'm not sure what the numbers are, but that's pretty good. It's much better yeah. than houses. And uh, so what we do is they, they, they call, they leave a voicemail. The voicemail says, on your letter, there's a reference ID number. Please leave on the voicemail your reference ID number, and we will send you an offer. Mm -hmm. All the voicemail says. The voicemail comes in. My boys get it. And then they go into, we use data tree to pull up uh, data, right? Um, so we see sometimes comps all over the board. Uh, but what I've been telling them to do is, all right, because there's a way you can like pull up that actual property because we know what the APN number is. And there's a little button that looks like a crosshair and you click that and it then centers that property in the center. And then you can go out, you know, one mile, two mile, five miles. And I show them, all right, so now go to like, if it's a two acre lot, look for, you know, one to five acres that have sold in the last year in a five mile radius. Okay. Yeah. Now we'll see different kinds of comps. You see some investor comps and you know these are investor comps because they're like a thousand bucks an acre. And then you'll see maybe some retail comps and something in the middle. So what do you recommend when you were calculating an offer? What do you recommend? Do you recommend taking the average? Do you recommend looking just at those investor sold comps and then offer that? What do you say? And then I have a part two to that question, but please go ahead. Uh, so first thing, a, a quick comment on DataTree. So I, I use DataTree too. I think it's a fantastic tool. 
But whether you know it's DataTree or RealQuest Pro or Agent Pro 247, whatever your aggregation data aggregation program is, it's only as good as the data provided by the counties. Yeah. Uh, some counties will provide um, sold prices, some won't. If it's in a non-disclosure state, you're not going to get any prices out of data tree. So it's it's one one source of data, but I'm I'm not sure I would use it as my only source of data. Right. Um, then uh, there are a couple different approaches to doing this. One approach is you can take all of the comps that you've gotten. Um, I typically try to weed out all of the investor comps. Really. I mean, it's interesting. I might look at it just to see what other people are offering. But what I really care about is what's the retail market? Because my prices should be based upon an honest retail market value. Um, so I actually try to weed out the investor comps. I weed out all of the uh, the outliers, high and low. And then what, what some, sometimes that I do, and if somebody taught me this, it's good, is what I'll do is I'll, I'll find the median. And it's uh, a lot of people know this, but let me just say this, because it's really kind of important, the yeah, difference is, between an average and a median. Yeah. This is really so average. Yes. Yeah, so, so average takes all the properties and says, what's the average price? So let me add up the, the, the value of all of it and then divide it by the number of properties. That's the average. The median says, give me the point at which half the properties are above it and the other half of the properties are below it. And the median will also help you get rid of mm -hmm. false information based upon outliers that maybe you missed. Right. It just gives you the halfway point. Uh, and what some people do, and, and I've done this, and I think it's not a bad way to do it, is they they find the median and then they delete all of the more expensive properties. Hmm. And then they take an average of the bottom half. Interesting. Really? Yeah. Is there a so statistical, that, yeah. is there a fancy statistical term for that? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. But the guy who did that was a customer of Landspeed who has spent 40 years as a doctor. So he's a science guy by, by and he was really? killing he was killing it. Um, he's now killing it in the uh, marijuana business. But, uh, you know, an absolutely terrific guy and wow. very, very uh, analytical approach to how he did this. It okay. So let's talk about this. You, you you take the median and you remove everything above it and you just yeah. take then the average of what's below it. Right. And that's what you offer? Well, so that, that, gives you, that gives you the average market value that you're going to use. And then what I do is I convert that into uh, a price per acre. Mm -hmm. And then I'll multiply and I'll multiply that times my offer value. So if my offers are going to be 20 cents on the dollar, mm -hmm. I take my average price per acre and I multiply it times 20 percent. And then I go onto my list and I just multiply I just in one cell on my spreadsheet. I multiply that times the parcel size and I just pull it down my entire list and it prices all my properties for me. OK, um, this is really good because. Just getting my wheels turning. There's everybody has different ways of doing it, you know. Um, one of the things that I like to do though is I like to look at those investor comps and I say, all right, so investors are offering a thousand bucks an acre. That's what I'm gonna offer. Yeah. Because these are probably guys that are doing well, you know, and uh so I'm gonna offer the same. And uh it, that's kind of what I've been doing, but I like the idea because sometimes I'm like, man, if I average median or if I I don't know. And then, okay, once I get a number, do I do 25% of that or 20% of that? And then I'm just kind of lost and confused. So like, when do you, do you actually then go look at what properties are actively listed for in that County and see, all right, so if I'm going to buy this for $2,000 an acre, what is my competition out there currently advertising their properties for? Am I going to be, am I trying to be below them? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so, um, so there's two times you do this pricing. The first time you do the pricing is when you're, when you're pricing all your blind offers. The second time you would do it is when you're actually going deep into one property to say, yeah. all right, what do I really want to pay for it? Um, absolutely. You are correct. You know, you want to see what other, other people are offering the properties, but when an investor sells the property, you would imagine that they're selling it in relationship to whatever the market value is. Now, if they're trying to undercut the market a little bit, that will be reflected in the average. So it's already incorporated in there. If you leave those, if you leave those comps in, um, so I would leave. I would leave in the comps when they're selling the property. I just don't want the comps when they're buying the property. Yes, I, I'll okay. look at that separately. So you know, if, if you see sellers are selling on average a ten-acre lot for ten thousand dollars. 
what what are you thinking? All right, well, I want to sell mine for eight thousand dollars. Well, I don't care what other investors are doing. Like I said, it just shows up in the averages. What what I'm what I would probably do is um, I'll give you an example. So it depends on the quality of the GIS system in the county. GIS is the, is the mapping system that the county uses. D you know, different counties have different quality of G GIS. Yeah. One county that's got a phenomenal GIS is Coconino County, Arizona. And the beautiful thing about it is if I go into Coconino, I can hone in on my property, pull, zoom it out so I can see the whole map of the area. And there's a little button there where it'll give me all the recent sold data. So not only can I see what properties have sold in the area recently, uh, and, and it, it breaks it out by, by either just vacant land or with improvements. So I, obviously I only care about the vacant land. So what I'll do is I'll look at those sold comps that are just geographically right around the property that I'm looking to buy. Those are the ones that are most relevant to me. Uh, right. So if I can get away with that, I'll, I'm going to do that. Um, if I can't, uh, you know, like I said, you know, it, I, I figure out the averages and uh, and what I typically would want. And this is a, a kind of an important topic. Um, if you want to increase your deal flow, you got to create, you know, velocity of money. And, you know, there's math around this that would show that it's better to have a lower price and sell quicker and turn that money over many times a year rather than get the maximum you can on every property. Um, but every time you do that, if you if you price under the market, you're, you're you know, you're contributing to bringing the overall price structure down. It can kind of destroy a county after a while. So what I typically would do is I figure out the median market price. And I would undercut it by, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 percent if I had to in order to shorten my sales cycle and then I can turn my money over quicker. Yeah, that's important. Do you prefer to sell on cash or terms with your own deals? Oh, that's another great question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think uh, what, what tends to happen is when new people come into land investing, they start out in cash for two reasons. One, because it's easier. You know, it's a little more complicated to do under finance deals. Uh, and two, because they may not be bringing a ton of capital into the game. So they need the cash to be able to purchase more properties and start growing their, their capital uh, uh, bucket there. Um, and then what will happen is as their capital increases, they'll start making a shift. OK, maybe now I'm going to try to do 20 percent uh, terms and 80 percent cash. And then over time, maybe it moves to a 50 50. And then they say, well, wouldn't it be great if I could generate enough owner finance deals so that my monthly recurring income covers my nut? And now I'm going to go to 80 percent terms and 20 percent cash. So it, there's not a right or wrong answer to the question. It really comes down to where you are in the journey, I think. My what well, we started, we've only done cash deals. We just have been thinking about doing terms. Um, so we've made a lot of profit. But what I've been telling my boys is, you know what? If you want to start doing real estate as a business going forward, uh, you should wholesale anything you get, houses or land. Wholesale them um, until you can cover your monthly overhead that you need for marketing and your own expenses. Anything above that, then just hold it, sell it on terms or owner financing. And then eventually, you know, every month, that's what you do. You just wholesale the first couple of deals to cover your expenses. Anything after that, you keep to um, sell on terms and build that up to where eventually you'll have enough money cash flow coming in from your owner financing deals to cover your monthly expenses. And then you can just decide whatever you want to do. Um, cool. I got some more questions here from people that are coming in. Um, this is from Alexander. Howard, is there more value in doing land deals in town or out in rural areas? Can you talk Do you do? What do you recommend? And I have been seeing some people buying land in small towns super ridiculously cheap and selling them and doing all right with that. What, what's your philosophy on this? Um, so whether it's in a small town or whether it's in what we would call the donut around, say, a fast growing city, uh, they're often called infill lots infill, is the yeah. terminology that are, that's used. And, uh, and so the buyer of an infill lot would typically be a developer who would then buy that lot and put something on it, whether it's a spec home, well, typically it would be a spec home. Uh, so if the current economy is such that uh, real estate's going well and, and, and developers are active, it's a great strategy. 
Um, I've had, I have customers that have made a fortune in this strategy. Uh, but I always say the same thing. Never put all your eggs in one basket because the economy can change. And if that's the only strategy you've got moving right now and the economy changes, you're gonna, your whole business is going to dry up. Um, and we're kind of at that point right now with what's the economic fallout from coronavirus could crash the real estate market. And then all, all the developers are saying, no, 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 I'm not buying property right now. So you, you, you don't want to make that your only strategy. I think um, I would recommend, would you agree when you're starting, buy d rural recreational land, right? It's a little less risky. You can buy it cheaper than infill lots in the city. Would you agree? Well, I, I like, I always like to play whatever's the news cycle is great. Play the news cycle, right? Yeah. So now you need, whether you call it prepper land or whether mm -hmm. you call it, you know, your, 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 your bug out land, yeah, you know? Yeah. So if you're, if you're living in California right now and you, you're like worried about what's going on with coronavirus, wouldn't it be great to have a, a a 40 acre plot somewhere in Arizona that you could just t grab your bug out bag and, you know, get out of Dodge. Exactly. You know, so I always try to like leverage whatever's top of mind for people. You know, I, you know what I'm thinking about and, and I don't want to make this sound like I'm taking advantage of people in a difficult situation. Like that, let me just be real clear that we're not talking about taking advantage of people or how to profit from people's unfortunate situations. But I'm thinking New York city, one of the reasons why there are so many cases of coronavirus there is there's it's like the most densely populated city in the United States, one of the most densely populated cities in the world. Everybody's living on top of each other. I think I'm seeing maybe and predicting a, tr a, a trend going where people are going to want less people are going to be wanting to live in high density urban areas and are going to be wanting to be out in suburban areas and even out in the country. And I'm thinking people that are want to be in the New York area, maybe we should start looking at rural vacant land in the New England area, you know, a couple, three hours away from New York City that people can go to. What's your philosophy on that? Do you think, you know, um, and that kind of relates to the question I wanted to ask you, the, the current market shift that we're seeing right now, how is how do you recommend land investors start thinking about where they want to start? looking for new opportunities. Make sense? Yeah, for sure. So I live in that area. So I, I live in oh. Connecticut, but right on the New York border. So okay, uh, okay. right there. And, and uh, you know, that's it's kind of already happened, right? It, 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 that happens in the good times too. So if you're living in the city, you, you want your escape land where you can go and you know, breathe some fresh air and see some trees. Yes. And so all the way up the Hudson River Valley, up to say New Paltz, yeah. um, the, the land prices have been skyrocketing in the good times just because people want their getaway land. Yeah. And that starts to get into that two to three hour travel range from New York City. So, uh, in fact, we may have missed the window on it a little bit. You can go into the next county up, which is always an opportunity um, to get some cheaper land. Um, for people who are first starting out, you know, one of my recommendations is keep it simple. Because there's a lot to learn in any business, and there's going to be a lot to learn in this business. So don't overcomplicate things. Um, when I'm when I was starting out, I mean, I live in Connecticut. I, I could have purchased in Connecticut or New Jersey or all these places that I've lived, but I have certain knockout questions, you know, for for new new investors. One is, if property values are really high and you're a brand new investor, maybe not the best place to start. If property taxes are really high maybe not the best place to start. If bureaucracy and litigiousness, you know, lawsuits are really high, maybe not the best place to start. And finally, if it requires an attorney to close every single real estate transaction, <laughs> maybe not the best place to okay. start. Okay, point well taken, very good. Um, okay, so what do you recommend, Howard, then? What do you see the, what, where do you see the, the market going with land investing particularly? Are you bullish or bearish on on land? So we live in very interesting times, and I don't think any of us has a crystal ball to say where things are going as a result of this coronavirus. But if we take that and kind of put it off to the side for the moment and say this snapshot in time today, you know, will the economy bounce back? What's going to happen? You know, I talk to a lot of land investors all the time, and um, and what I'm seeing right now is that things have not slowed down at all. If anything response to letters has massively increased. Yeah. And I attribute that to the fact that people are home and actually reading their mail. <laughs> so that's that's good news. 
Um, I just saw a post today. This guy just said, I, I sold six properties last week. Six you properties know? last week. Last week. You know, so so properties are still moving. And um, and I think that, you know, conceptually, what you were talking about is, you know, people living in these densely populated areas, they want to have, you know, this uh, more rural land. I agree with that. Um, so I'm always interested in that that next donut around a fast growing, particularly tier two cities, I like better than tier one almost. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know what you would define a tier two as, but I might define it as, you know, an Austin versus a New York City. Um, yeah. And, uh, but even smaller than that is, is potentially too, because people come in, they work in the city, but they want their getaway land. They want to go hunting. They want to go ATV or whatever it is they want to do. Um, so I think that's good. I think right now, you know, if you market it right, prepper land, you know, bug out land, whatever you want to call it. Absolutely. You know, if you live in a big city, if you live in Denver or in Colorado, you know, I'm going to put a, a cabin on it. It's going to be off grid. And, you know, it, it, when the zombie apocalypse comes, that's where I'm taking my family. And so the government that, comes to take all my guns. Yeah, exactly. There's just there's always opportunity. And it's really about, you know, it's a very big country. and despite what we may think living in our cities, it's a very sparsely populated country. I think I've read that if you took every human being in the United States and put them right next to each other, it would maybe occupy Manhattan. And I read too, if you took the whole world and gave them a three by three foot square, they would cover the state of Texas. Yeah. Every person in the world would cover the entire state of Texas. If you give them a three by three foot, um, and, you know, uh, I heard something else, too. If you took everybody in the world and gave them the same population density person per square mile as in New York City, um, they would they would cover the area of Los Angeles. I think I read something like that. The, hmm. the entire population of the world, the same density as New York City, the entire like not just downtown L.A., but like the whole huge city of LA county, county of LA County. That's what I think it was LA County. Yeah. Anyway, the, uh, Howard, people are thinking, and I want to talk about your CRM because it's really amazing. It's called land speed. But first, you know, how do you compare people think um, there's not that much land out there, right? There's too much comp. I'm worried about too much competition. There's too many other investors now looking at land. Um, I'm, I missed the opportunity. I missed the boat. Um, aren't there going to be, you know, if, aren't, aren't there going to be too many people now competing, trying to find land deals? Can you talk about like the, how much land is out there? People don't even realize and compare that to maybe what in the housing housing market. Does that make sense? Sure. It's a big country. I mean, what is it, billion or billions of acres of land in this country. And that's excluding Alaska, uh, which is, you know, unto itself. Um, there's so much land. There's so much opportunity that, you know, all the land investors combined in their lifetimes couldn't match the opportunity size. Where people, I think, get this issue of, you know, is it oversaturated? It, it's not an illegitimate argument. What happens is um, a lot of the schools that are bringing people into the field um, are, are teaching this cheap rural land uh, model which is fine. I mean, it's a legitimate model, right? But it always leads you into the same areas. It leads you into these sunbelt states and these sunbelt counties. And so all these new people are coming in and they're working in the same counties. Um, and what happens is, and, and amazingly, there's still actually money to be made there. It's just not as easy it was when I started in the beginning of 2016. Um, but uh, what... I think I lost my train of thought there for a well, second. You, you were talking about like states like Colorado and Arizona, Nevada, um, Nevada, yeah. New Mexico. Like that's where everybody, when they buy these courses, that's where they're focusing. But there's a lot of other opportunity around the United States. And, and that's it. So, so I would say that uh, if you want to break away, well, well, that's what I was going to say. First of all, a lot of these people that are coming in, they're not going to survive because I'm just being honest, not everybody is truly an entrepreneur. You know, an entrepreneurial journey is a very up and down journey. You've got to be able to weather the downs the downside in order to val, you know, to to, you know, get the appreciation of the upside. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, they get to that downside and emotionally it's just too much for them and they say this isn't for me and they walk away. You know, fair enough. But before they do that, 
they send mail. And all this mail is hitting the same people and they're getting in. So, that, so I think the, on the receiving end, the property owners are getting a false sense of the value of their property. So it does cause a problem in some of these counties that are very saturated. So if you want to get away from that, if you want to break away from the pack, there are a few ways to do it. One is go to other counties besides those very commonly uh, yeah. common counties where everybody's starting. And there's, you know, it's, it, what are there? 10, 20 of them that, you know, people really coalesce to. We're only talking like 1% of the entire counties in the United States. Yeah, there's over 3,100 counties. You know? And I was looking at one county the other day, and I won't say where, that had 23,000 lots. Yeah. In one county. Yeah. Blown away. All right. Well, I mean, you go to Florida, and in Florida, you know, especially before 2008, these developers came in, they bought this land, they platted it all out into these quarter acre lots so that everybody could either have a McMansion or a mobile home. And then after 2008, it all just kind of died, but the, but the, plat, the platted land is still there. So one subdivision in Florida might have more individual lots than entire counties out West. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of opportunity out there. All right, Howard. Land speed. Why did you create land speed? What does it do? So I, as I mentioned earlier, I got to this point where my deal flow went up and I wasn't able to manage it on spreadsheets uh, or, um, or post-it notes. And I was mailing out of my house. And I had lunch with a friend of mine who is a serial entrepreneur who I've worked for in a tech startup. And, uh, and, and I was, he was asking me what I was doing as I was telling him all about land investing and how, how, and how I was doing it. Uh, and he, he looked, he like put his fork down. He looked at me and he said, as men will say to men, Howard, you're an idiot. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? No offense. He said, if you want to make big money, you have to solve big problems and you can't solve big problems. If you're wasting all of your time solving little administrative problems, like figuring out how to get mail out the door. And that was a big aha moment for me. Yeah. And I immediately came home and I started the process of automating my mailing process. And I did that and I, and I got the bug at that point. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to process map the entire workflow of the land business. And I'm going to take it one step at a time, one chunk at a time. So first I did mailing, then I'll do due diligence, then I'll do closing, then I'll do marketing, then I'll do sales, I'll do default. And I took it one step at a time and I went really, really deep. And time was on my side because I was just doing it for my own business. And I could, I could apply my full ADD nature into this. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I did it. I built the whole thing out. And, uh, and at, at the point when I said, you know, I think I'm done, uh, I shared it with some of my other friends in the business. And their reaction was, well, heck, we want this. Yeah. And that's how Land Speed was born. And we started offering it to, uh, to the larger community in the uh, summer of 2017. So um, what does it do? So the goal was to automate everything that could possibly be automated in the workflow. Uh, now, not everything can be automated in the workflow. Some things have to be done by humans. Um, and oftentimes, as you mentioned earlier, we use virtual assistants. However, this is the key. Um, while the content of a deal is always different from one deal to the next, the process is always the same. And so when it hits a certain point in the process, it creates a trigger so that you can automatically send a task to a VA with a scripted, do this, these three things. And at the end of those three things, set the, set it to the next step step in the process, which then will create that trigger for the next thing that happens. So even the tasking of your VAs is automated. Yeah. Yeah. And um, did you build this from the ground up? Did you build it on top of Podio or another platform or what did you do? I built it on top of Podio, um, and, and Podio I, I find to be particularly um, adaptive to uh, to real estate because uh, I find that the process in land is a very linear process. You know, first I do this, then I do this, then I do this, um, and and because you can create these apps yeah. in in Podio, it just it just takes you over, along the process. Now, building something in Podio. Uh, is actually not that easy because you look at it and say, this is a very powerful tool, can do a lot of things, but it's sort of like looking at a blank canvas. You got to figure out how to paint it, yeah. right? So what are the apps? What's in the apps? You know, what functionality or what information do I want to capture? So then you paint the app 
And then you have to so now you have to stop thinking like a painter and you have to start thinking like an animator because now I want to automate things. And so now I'm going in, I'm saying, okay, when I do this, I want all this data from before to flow into this app because I certainly don't want to be rekeying anything. And I want all of this to be available so I can just hit a button and create a, do a legal document that I feel confident in. And, uh, and it goes on and on and on. So you got to paint it, then you got to automate it yeah. and refine it. Yeah. So talk about what is some of the automation that it does? Um, does it send out, it sends letters? What else? So it does send letters. And I, it, perhaps I could just hone in on that one little piece because I think the quality of a solution uh, determines, you know, it's based upon its, its functionality. Right? So it, yeah, a lot of solutions can mail, right? What Landspeed does is, is you upload your entire list into Landspeed and then you can create a campaign. And the campaign will say something like, I want to send 30 letters per day through Friday to Hernan County, Florida, between today and June 30th. Go. And so every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or Monday through Friday, 30 letters are going to go out the door. There's nothing more you have to do until, you know, uh, July 1st. Yeah. That's good, but that's not enough. So the next thing it does is you can mix and match blind offers and neutral offers within the same campaign. So when you upload your list, if there's an offer value, Landspeed understands that that's a blind offer and you can use the blind offer template. If there's no offer, then Landspeed understands that that's a neutral offer and it'll automatically apply the neutral offer template. So you can nice. mix and match in the same campaign. Um, the last piece, well, there's two, a couple more pieces. One is, uh, is a bit of strategy. Um, I am a big believer in mailing every single day. Not everybody is, but I am. And there are a lot of reasons why. One, it smooths out my business. If I'm always mailing, I'm always getting calls, I'm always doing due diligence, I'm always closing, I'm always selling. And so I'm doing everything in the business every day. Whereas if I sent out 2,000 letters or 3,000 letters at a time, then I sit around and twiddle my thumbs till they land in people's mailboxes and then my phone's ringing off the hook and everything gets very spiky. And I don't like spiky businesses. The other reason I like to mail every single day is because I'm a data guy and I like feedback. If I sent out 2,000 blind offers, I have no opportunity to adjust my pricing. It's done. But if I mail those same 2,000 and, and I break it down and send them every day, then I'm getting feedback from the marketplace. And if I'm getting fewer responses than I expect to get, that might indicate that my pricing is too low for that particular market. Or if I'm getting too many responses, that might indicate that my pricing is too high for that market. So within the campaign function in land speed, there's a little adjustment factor. So I can just go in and I can say, put a two in there. And then what, for all the subsequent mailings, it'll just increase all of my prices by 2%. Huh. Or I can put a negative three and it'll, all my subsequent mailings will decrease the prices by 3%. By 3%. Nice. nice. Uh, the only way that you can cost effectively and efficiently mail every single day is if you have really low mailing rates. One of the reasons people send in bulk is because it's the only way to get a discount out of the mail houses like click to mail or letter stream or whoever. Uh, but what we did at Landspeed is we've aggregated the volume of our entire community and used that to negotiate. So everybody gets the low rates and it doesn't matter. And the important thing is that there's no volume commitment. So it doesn't matter whether you send one letter a month or 10,000 letters a month, you still get the same low rates. And that's why you can mail every single day. Oh, beautiful. And uh, so you've you've partnered with the mail house then to do the mail. Yes, very cool. Um, how can people? We're we're coming up to an hour here. This has gone by really fast. Uh, how can people see a demo of Land Speed um, and maybe see if there's something they want to be interested in? Yeah. So go to um, the best thing is to go to Facebook to my Facebook page. It's uh, just Facebook.com/slash Land Biz Automation. L-A-N-D-B-I-Z automation. Uh, and you can click the button and set up a 15-minute call with me. Let's chat. I'd like to understand where you are in the process. We've got a couple different solutions that we can cater based upon you know, what your needs are. Uh, and then we'll take it from there and I'll make sure you, you see whatever you need to see in order to make a, a good quality decision. Good. So I'm going to type this in here. Is that right? Facebook.com slash land biz automation. That's it. And, and, and Joe, if I could just make one last point. Yes. Um, about a week or two ago, you uh, interviewed uh, a very good hey. friend of mine, David Van Steenkist. Yes. Uh, so Dave and I go way back, uh, and uh, he's been a land speed customer for over two years now. 
Um, we were very good friends. And so we decided to take all of the educational stuff out of land speed and create a new company for this, which we call land.mba. Thank you for putting that up there. Mm. Um, like land.mba is, is, is pretty unique. So if you're coming into this business or if you're in this business and you really want to scale it, um, it, it's a one-stop shop because basically our, the packages we've created include all of the education, all of the tools, all of the community and deal financing. So everything that you need to be successful, you can get through these packages that we've created. And uh, I would really encourage people to take a look because uh, if, whether, whether you're uh, a new land investor or you just want to kind of get to that next scaling point in your business, I think there's a lot to offer there. You just updated your website too. You used to have a flyover of some really beautiful land and now you've yeah. got some dude. What, what, yeah, what happened? It, 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 a work in progress. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the land was great if you want to build a, a land in, a land investor website selling land. But uh, what we're actually selling is is knowledge <laughs> and success. So a little different. Well, I, for my two cents, whatever it's worth, I loved, I, that was such beautiful land that you were flying over. And uh, you said on there, think big, start small, scale fast. I love that. Three things. That's really good. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> so land.mba. So Dave Van Stinsky. Van Stinsky yeah. Yes. I interviewed him. I just released that podcast a couple of days ago. And uh, it's a really good interview talking with Dave on how he does his land investing. He's partnered with Howard here. And they've created a really, really unique education program. It's a combination of coaching and product at land.nba. And it looks very, very good. I'm I'm excited about it. I love uh, getting, there's a lot of different guys out there that have land courses and I've probably interviewed all of them. Um, but I always say, listen, when it comes to, should I get this course or this course or this one? I say, get them all because they all have different angles, different unique approaches. And I've learned things from different investors that teach different things and ways to do it. Um, but I definitely check out recommend you check out land.nba. That's a good program. Howard and Dave are very active in the business. And um, cool. We got some more questions here. Do you have time for one more question? Sure. This is from Jordan. Not sure if you talked about this yet. Are developers and builders still buying land during the recession? I guess we're coming, we're, we're assuming that we're coming into a recession with this question. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen the slowdown yet. I don't think the reality of our current economic situation has completely flowed through the psyche of Americans yet. Um, I, and, it, and we're only two, what, two weeks into this quarantine. So I think we need to wait until the next set of statistics come out about housing starts and all of, all of what's going on to really understand what the answer to that question is. I think for the moment, it still seems okay. But if your only strategy is to sell to developers, I would say now's the time to think of some additional strategies and not have all your eggs in one basket. Very good. All right. So we gave three websites on this podcast, landspeedtech.com slash price dash boss. If you want some more information about Landspeed, which is the, um, the, the, the price boss, I'm sorry, is the software spreadsheet that helps you come up with comps. You just copy all of the Zillow data right from the Zillow website. You just copy the website like you highlight it and then command C or control C to copy it, go to a spreadsheet and command V or control V to paste it. And it takes that stuff and puts it into a table and analyzes it. It's amazing. So check that out. Um, if you're interested in the land speed CRM, uh, go to facebook.com slash land biz automation. And again, all these links will be in the show notes at real estate investing masteries website. And if you're interested in getting some education on it, go to land.nba. On the previous podcast with Dave, I called it landmba.com. So that's what was wrong. This is correct. It's land.mba. Cool. Thank you, Howard, for uh, taking the time to, uh, to be here. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Joe. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, I hope uh, I hope uh, provided some value to your audience. Uh, yes, yes, you have for sure. All right. So hold on one second, but we're going to say goodbye here to everybody. Thank you, everybody. Uh, if you want the show notes, again, go to realestateinvestingmastery.com, realestateinvestingmastery.com to get the transcripts and the show notes of this podcast. Um, until next time, we'll see you around. Subscribe to the podcast. Again, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe. We will see you all later. Bye-bye.